All right, so we're continuing our series on the words of Jesus. And really, if we were to recap everywhere that we have been, basically, it's this. Jesus called his disciples. He set them apart as his ambassadors. That means that he... Uh, that his disciples would represent him to everyone else. Now, after that time, we see the sending of the disciples. And you're not seeing what I'm seeing, so let me uh, put this up here. Let's see. So we're going to start with the sending of the disciples out. And that's Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1. Jesus, wow, here we go. Let's try again. Say, be obedient. Go there. All right, thank you. Verse 1 says, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Now, as we look at uh, Matthew chapter 10, we've got a challenge. Some things in the scripture are very easy for us to apply to our own life and to basically live out. But there are some things in scripture that are written specifically to a group of people or specifically for a time. And so everything that's said to them, we can't automatically say, okay, this is mine. For instance... uh, Some of you here maybe have prayed for people and they have gotten healed. Praise the Lord for that. But there's the possibility that God may give the gift of healing to someone and more, they'll see more healings. Like when they lay hands, most people will get healed. That's the gift of healing operating in their life. Well, what we see here is that Jesus gave them. So if you give something to someone, it's called a what? A gift. First Corinthians talks about how we're all given different gifts. Well, here we see Jesus gives them the gift of the authority to drive out impure spirits and the gift to be able to heal every disease and sickness. So the challenge in interpreting this is we may not have that gift of healing or we may not have that gift of the authority to drive Uh, out in pure spirits. We can call and pray and God may do those things. But here we need to apply this to our lives. So how do we do that? So the question for us is today, what gift have you been given? Now think about this. How has God wired you? Has he called you to do something uh, maybe that someone else is not called to. Uh, many different things. Uh, you could be called to, to write letters to people. You could be called to pray for people. You could be called to teach a class. So many different things and ways that you can use your gift. So I want you to stop for a minute and don't just listen to me. I want you to take your pencil if you've got it. And then right now in this moment, do you have a gift, something that God has called you to, a gift that he has given you? If you do, or if you can think of that, I want you to write it down. Could be simple, could be big. I just want you to write it down. What gift have you been given? Now, we're going to have several questions. So for the sake of time, I'm going to keep moving. But what I want you to do is today, afterwards, or this week, I want you to take some more time on each one of these questions. Because the truth is, the disciples, the ambassadors were sent out, but I believe that we are sent out into this world as well. So if we skip to verse 5, it says, These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Here's what he told them to do before they go out. It says, Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. So again, here you see what I'm talking about. If we were to apply this right to ourselves, does that mean that we're not supposed to go to the Gentiles? No. Uh, well, most of us are Gentiles, right? <laughs> okay? We're not Jews. And so, so that wouldn't apply to us. But for them, at that specific time, God told them, I want you to, to minister to your people, to the Jewish people. I want you to go to them first. Don't even go into the, the Samaritan uh, villages. What I want you to do is to minister to the lost sheep of Israel. So how do we apply this then? 
Well, the question is, who are you called to? What are the parameters of your ministry? So if you go and you look at the gift that you have been given, think about it in your head, where are you supposed to use that gift? Uh, Is this a ministry or a gift to elderly people? Is it a a ministry to children? Uh, Is it to veterans? Is it to people in the art community? Where are you supposed to use your gift for God? Now, the reason why we talk about this is, what's the opposite of that? It's, it's like the difference between you have a, a rifle and you got a target and you eye that target and you make one shot or then you got the guy with the machine gun and, and hope, hopes he hits something, you know? Uh, the idea is you can spread all your energy all so many places that you make no, no good at all. For instance, let's think about the things that we can do inside the church. Uh, there's the nursing home ministry that Homer is involved with. There's the youth. There's the, the children, Royal Rangers, the girls club. Uh, and the list goes on. We could card writing. Uh, all these things. Can I do all those things? No. If I try to do it, what happens? I'm not ready for Sunday morning, right? So the more I do the less effective I am at all of those things. So ask God, if you've got a gift, what are the parameters? What am I supposed to do specifically? Who are you calling me to? And then write that down. Let's continue on verse 7. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, many of you remember John the Baptist. What was his message that he said? Anybody? Anybody? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So when Jesus said this, the repent is is an understood part of this. In light of the fact that the kingdom of heaven is here, then you need to repent. It was something that the disciples understood. So I want to stop and talk a little bit about this message that he's giving them. Notice he doesn't send the disciples to tell them how good God is and what a difference that God can make in their lives. Right? That wasn't the call upon the disciples. They were called to tell people, hey, God is coming quickly. You better get ready. If you're sinning, you need to repent and get your life right with God. So that brings us to us. What is your message? Say you've got this gift. You know where you're supposed to use it to the people. But what is it that you really want to convey? What's the message or the heart behind what you're doing? All I want to say here is this. Don't neglect all of the message. Here in today's time, uh, it is so tempting to not talk about hell. It's so tempting not to tell the the truth that if people don't come to Christ, they're going to die and go to hell. But what is the gospel? It's the good news. And the question is, I know you've heard this before, is can you have the good news without the bad news? It's not good, right? If you think your life is all fine, why would you need a savior? The truth is we got to tell people that you've sinned, you've done wrong before God, and this is what's going to happen. But here's the good news. God has come to save you. So think about the gift that you have and then ask yourself the question, how can I convey the truth of God through this gift that he has given me? Verse 8, Jesus says to them, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, Drive out demons. This is the part I want you to focus on in this verse. Freely you have received, freely give. So they had been poured in through Jesus. He had given these gifts and he had taught them. And now it was their turn, just as Jesus had freely given to them, they're going to freely give their gifts to others. So let's look at that for us. Are you using what you have been given? Now this is a yes or no question And this should be convicting, right? I want you to think about the gift that you just wrote down, people that you're called to. Are you currently using this gift for God? And the challenge is you've received freely from God. He gave you this gift. Maybe he gave you that voice to sing, but are you using that for God? Verse 9 kind of continues this, and we're going to follow on that freely you've received, freely gift thing. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff. For the worker is worth 
his keep. So what is Jesus telling them? He's telling them, you're going to devote your life to using this gift, to tell people about me. You're you're challenging them to repent and change their life. But this is going to be your main occupation. And what he's telling them is, it's okay for people to give to you because what you're doing is work. And it's important work. So what about that for us? Let's think about the gift that you have been given. Do you need financial help for your ministry? I would say... Uh, For the most of us, we can use the things that we have and the things that God gives us, we can just simply use that. But a question to kind of help us to apply this to our life is, is this your main thing that you do? That's your focus, your work. If that is, that might be something that God might want you uh, to have that need supplied through others. Verse 11, whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. So here they're being sent out into all these different villages to tell people about Christ. And when they're to go in, they're supposed to look for someone worthy to enter their house. Basically, what are they saying here? Look for somebody that will feed you, a place to stay, you know, somebody to, to be alongside of you. So how do we apply this to us? Who will help you? Who will be part of your team? So stop and think about this. What's the gift that you have been given? Do you need other people there? Maybe you say to yourself today, well, my ministry is writing cards to people when they're sick. I don't really need anybody. Well, maybe you do. Maybe you could ask a friend, say, hey, I'm doing this. Will you pray for me that as I write these things that God will give me the words that I'm supposed to say? Or, hey, what happens if you're sick? Who's going to Take up alongside of you. Maybe you get a friend to come alongside you and help you in that. So think about who will help you, who will be part of your team. Now, as you enter the home, give it your greeting. For instance, they might say, shalom or peace be with you. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. Let that blessing rest on that house. If it is not, let your peace return to you. So let's stop and think about that for us. Will you bless and thank those who help you? Uh, I want to say this is a hard one for me, not because I don't want to thank, but I'm scared if I begin to thank people right now that I'd leave somebody out. Because the truth is, all of you, most of you, are doing things for God. So just a blanket statement here. Thank you all for all the ways that you serve here at this church. And to follow that up, If you've got people helping you in the ministry uh, that you're involved with, have you taken time to bless them, to thank them for taking you in, to help you in this ministry? Added to that, will you bless and thank those who receive your ministry? For instance, uh, where brain work. (laughs) Sometimes I leave it. Steve. Steve works with the Royal Rangers uh, right now. You know, part of Steve's ministry is he can thank God for those children that he is ministering to, and he can bless those. Why? Well, without the children, he wouldn't be teaching, right? God wouldn't be using him in that way. In the same way, I thank God for all of you listening, because I wouldn't be here if you're not listening, right? (laughs) You're a blessing to me. Uh, Verse 14, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Did you know that in that time, some of the religious uh, Jews, when they would go into a Gentile nation, maybe or a Gentile area where it is known for sin, they would actually take off their cloak and they would shake it out. Some would even leave that cloak there. And the reason why they did it is they didn't want any part of the wickedness that was happening in the area. And so they would actually leave it there as a sign. And that was a sign of all these things, everything that they're involved with, that's going to be judged. It's going to be destroyed by God. And I don't want any part of it. And so we see in this what Jesus says, an element of that. Because what's happening is when the people are rejecting the people that are telling them about Christ, they're rejecting Christ and they're leaving themselves in a place of judgment. 
So I want to make a point here, and it's for us. Are you prepared for rejection? So those of you that have written down your gift that maybe God has used you in the past, has anyone ever rejected that gift? You said, I want to do this for God, and somebody comes up to you and says, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> it's not going to work, never work. Have you been rejected? Have you tried to, how many of you have tried to witness to somebody, tell them about Christ only to have them say, I don't want to hear about Jesus. Just keep your opinions to yourself. What you need to understand is rejection will happen. It happened to Jesus. It happened to Jesus' disciples. It's something that we have to prepare for. Verse 16 tells us a little bit more about this. He says, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Okay, here's your tough question for the day. What do wolves do to sheep? They eat them up. Okay, they devour them, take advantage of them. And so Jesus is saying, while you're trying to do this good thing, to use your gift for God, people are going to try to take advantage of you. They're going to try to hurt you, put you down. And in light of that, you need to be as shrewd as snakes, but as innocent as doves. What does that basically mean? You need to be smart, okay? Don't put yourself in situations, generally speaking, that are going to be bad, okay? Use your brain about how to handle these things. But in this, be as innocent as doves. If someone is trying to hurt you, that doesn't mean that you have to go and hurt them. If they're saying bad things about you in your ministry, doesn't mean that you have to go and say bad things about them. Uh, you don't get involved in the sin that they are doing. So let's ask a question for yourself. What is the danger associated with your calling? So think about the gift that God has given you. What's the danger that maybe you need to be aware of? And then a follow-up question, understanding this danger, how do you combat or avoid it without sinning? So if people rise up against you this way, how do you respond to it without sinning? A great scripture that talks about that is 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. It says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So you've heard that saying, fight fire with fire. We don't do that. When someone says mean and wicked things about us, what do we do? Bless you. I pray that God will, will move in your life. We love them. That's what God has called us to do. Bless those who curse you. We operate in a different way. But in light of that, verse 17 says, be on your guard. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witness to them and to the Gentiles. Anybody see something interesting about that verse? What was the scope of their ministry? It was to the, the Jewish people. But wait a minute. Here Jesus is telling them that they're going to be a witness to even the Gentiles. So what we see here is in Jesus' uh, wonderful knowledge, he's giving them a direct thing. Here's what I've called you to, to minister to the Jewish people first. But he also knows that after he's resurrected, there's going to come a time where that gospel is going to spread out even further than that, and they are going to be witnesses, even to the Gentiles. And maybe Jesus even sees into the future Paul uh, in a situation like this. So here's the second question. We've asked, are you ready for rejection? But are you ready for persecution? Now, when I think about persecution... Uh, I see the light of it in high school. Maybe some of you have, you know, been confronted uh, with like false teaching when it comes uh, to evolution and all that kind of stuff. And you've had to take your stand and say, no, I believe that God has created all things. And maybe people have made fun of you for that. That's a very light level of persecution. But you know what's happening all around the world today, right? I, one of the things that I heard, and this is just strange to me. One of the Middle East areas, 
uh, they have this ban on Christian churches. They can exist, but they are not allowed to make any renovations whatsoever. So there was this church that had a toilet that wasn't working. And so they put in for a permit, can we fix our toilet? And uh, they went a year without anything happening. So they finally said, let's do something about it. So they replaced the toilet. So what happens? The officials come in and they break the toilet and they do damage to the church. I mean, what harm is a toilet? I mean, really? Well, I guess it'd be how bad the toilet was. But but anyway, (laughs) here's the point. That's light. Still, people are losing their life for Christ. So are you ready for persecution? If you're using your gift for God, people make fun of you or try to hurt you. Will you stand firm? Verse 19, but when they arrest you, don't worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. And I can see in that moment here, they're they're dragged before the courts and they're asked about their faith. In that moment, they are filled with the Holy Spirit and they begin to speak those words of God boldly. So a question for us is, Are you in communion, fellowship with the Holy Spirit so he can give you the words to say in time of need? Let's say uh, that that God has called you to uh, pass out water uh, in the local local square, okay? So you're passing out that water and then all of a sudden somebody comes to you and says you can't do this and starts giving you a hard time and tries to make your life difficult. What are you going to do in that moment? Well, two scenarios. One, if you haven't done anything else, you just walk out there blindly and are giving, maybe God will help you in that moment. But how about a different scenario? What if you've been spending time with God in the morning, you've been in fellowship with him, even as you're passing out those water bottles, you're talking with him? I believe that he's going to give you those words freely in that moment. So the question and the thing that I want you to think about is, are you spending time with God? Because all your ministry, all the things you do without God are meaningless. Verse 21. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? So this section started off talking about how because of their faith, fathers were going to turn against their children and children were going to turn against their fathers. I want you to think for a minute what it would be like to grow up in a place where to become a Christian would break your family apart. There are many places around the world that are like this, where you take a stand for Christ and your family will disown you, not want to have anything to do with you. And here what Jesus is saying is, in that moment when you have a choice between your family and God, it should not be a choice. You should stay true to God. He's got to be the first. And here in this last part, what we see is the persecution. Uh, they called Jesus Beelzebub, the, the prince of demons. So if they called him that and made him out to be evil, they will do the same to us. So the question for us to think about, who has your first allegiance and devotion? Is it your family? Is it your work? Is it your school? Or is it God? Verse 26. So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So here's going to... There's, there might come a time when you're trying to use your gifts for God and you feel like the enemy is attacking you. Have you ever been there before God's called you to do something and it feels like the enemy's attacking you for it? You've been there? I've been there before. 
And here's what Jesus is saying. Don't be afraid of the enemy. There's a boundary. There's a limit to what he can do. He can kill your body, but he cannot take your soul. Instead, you should be afraid of disappointing me. That should be your focus. And for us today, will you allow fear of others or fear of the enemy to keep you from doing God's work? Or will you fear disappointing God more? I've talked to people before that have said, you know, I'm afraid to do this for God because last time I tried this, the enemy attacked me and it was just too bad. And so I'm going to kind of try to stay in neutral here. I'm not going to try to do anything because I don't want to upset the enemy. Is that what God wants for us? No. He wants us to to step out in faith and do the things that he has called us. Now, how does Jesus reassure them? Let's look at the next verse. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? So basically, these sparrows are are low value, okay? You could buy them for not that much money. Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. So he cares for them. Even though they're of low value, God cares about these sparrows, Now, some of you will relate to this. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Okay, for those of you that took a shower this morning, what did some of you find in that drain? Some hair, right? Some of you wish you found some hair in there, right? (laughs) Some of us have more come out than others. But just think about that. I I never saw that until uh, today when I was reading and going over this again. Think about all those hairs. They fall out every single day, right? But yet Jesus knows the count of our hair every single day. Even though it's changing, even there's so many of it, it's constantly in flux. God cares. Now, do you care about your hair that falls into the drain? Oh, come back to me. (laughs) Maybe you do. I don't know. But... Here, God knows how many hairs are on your head. So what is Jesus trying to say here? If God cares about the sparrows that are so cheap, if God cares about your hairs that you could care less about, he cares about you. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows or many pieces of hair. How about that? Verse 29 or through 31, here's our application to this. Do you trust that God is watching over you and his work through you? So think about your gift, how you want to use that. Think about what might come against you, the rejection, the persecution, possibly the enemy might try to stop you. And in light of that, I want you to stop right in this moment and say, God, do I trust you? If I step out in faith and do this that you have called me to, do I trust that you're going to take care of me? Settle that in your heart. Verse 32 gives us some more uh, encouragement. Whoever acknowledges me Before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. If you are willing to stand up in the face of fear and say, I believe in Jesus, and here's what he can do in your life, then he will acknowledge you before the Father. Verse 33 is a difficult part, but whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. You start to use that gift, and you begin to to get persecuted a little bit, and you say, you know... I kind of like God, but it's not that big of a deal in my life. It's, it's okay. And you kind of back away from your walk with Christ. This verse should challenge you. Whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. So question for us. Will you acknowledge your faith and relationship with God? Or will you deny your relationship with Him when pressure increases? So teens... When your friends ask you, do you really believe in this Jesus stuff? Do you go to church and all that kind of weird stuff? What are you going to say in that moment? People, when you're at workplace and you really go to, you give your money to a church? That's crazy. What are you going to say in that moment? Will you acknowledge your relationship with Christ or will you distance yourself? Verse 34, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Wait a minute. I thought Jesus was the Prince of Peace. And here he's saying, I've come to bring a sword? 
Let's think about this. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. What is Jesus talking about here? He wants problems in the family? No. It's important that we look at the very next verse. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. See, the reason why Jesus is saying this is they're about to go into a difficult situation telling people about the Savior, Jesus Christ, that can save their soul. And if they reject the Savior, then they are doomed to hell. Okay, so this is very important. And he realizes that some people are going to be involved in a family that will say to them, you know, if you believe and you follow this Jesus, then I am disowning you. You are not part of this family anymore. He realizes that they're going to have to make that level of, of faith. And so he's saying, in that moment, don't you dare uh, kowtow to that. Don't you dare love your, your family more than you love me. Because here's the truth. What happens if they love their family more than God? He disowns them. They die and go to hell. So is he strict in this? Yes, but it's for a purpose. In that moment, you have got to put me First, beyond everything else. Now, to make this where we live, what would we do in that moment? If a gun were up to our head, or if we were pressured that your family would not speak to you again if you continued in the faith, what would you do? Would you be able to stand firm and say, I believe in God no matter what? We need to prepare ourselves for that moment so that we'll stand firm. So here's the question. Do you love him more than anything? This is one that you can write now, but I want you to pray about this. Do I really, more than every other person in my life, do I love you the most, Lord? Here's the good news. Maybe you're here and you're thinking, well, I don't know if I can and do this, because if I do this, what, what is my family going to think? Well, here's the good news for you. If you love God first, you're going to be a way better husband. If you love God first, you're going to be a way better wife, a way better son or a daughter, because God's going to teach you how to love. Verse 38, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Let me ask you a question. Had Jesus been crucified when he said this? No. I want you to think about this. Then what is going on in the mind of the people when he says this? Whoever... Uh, does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Here's what's going on in their head. They're thinking of the Roman officials. What they would do is that these prisoners would be walked in shame. They would have to carry their cross leading to their death. They were branded as a criminal against the state of Rome or against the the nation of Rome. Empire, whatever it is. (laughs) Okay. So here it was kind of like a walk of shame and death was awaiting them. And Jesus was saying, if you're not willing to go to your death for me, to not deny me, then you're not worth me. And how does, how does that apply? Well, Jesus lived that out. He gave his life for each and every one of us so that we could be free. So here is a question to help you on this. What is your cross that you bear for him? maybe to help you think about this. Is there something that God has asked you to do and it's difficult, but he's calling you to be obedient in this area? What is your cross that you bear for him? Another question, what does it mean for you to carry your cross? Basically put, I think it's dying to yourself. The things that you want and saying, God, what you want is more important to me. And then the question I want you to ask yourself is, Are you carrying that cross? Are you being obedient to God, even if it's difficult? Verse 39, whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. You know, there are so many people out in the world today trying to find themselves, right? (laughs) 
if I can just do this, they're trying to find happiness, so they try this, and they try that, they try exploring, getting a different job, all to find this happiness that they are looking for. And it's all about me, 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 me. If I can just get what I want, I'll finally be happy. And what Jesus is saying is, if you spend your life that way, you're going to end up losing your life. But if you will lose your life, you will give your life for me, then that's when you're going to find true joy. Verse 39, the question for us is, what is your reward if you give it all for Jesus? So right now, you've, you've written down your gift that you're called to. He's sending you out. You might face, uh, face rejection. You might face persecution, but yet you're trusting God and you step out in faith. What is the reward that's waiting for you if you're obedient? Why am I asking this? We need to remember this. This is what helps us to continue on to serve God and do great things for him. What is your reward? It's rewards here on this earth, but it's also the reward of heaven and eternity with God. Let's not forget that. Verse 40, anyone who welcomes you uh, welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Think about this. We're going to have missionaries coming uh, Uh, throughout this summer and when we come and we give to them did you realize we're receiving a missionary's reward so the next time that missionary tells someone about jesus and they come to christ we we receive part of that reward isn't that pretty cool i think it is uh so did you realize everything that happens in this church when you give you're receiving part of that reward that's there And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives a cup of cold water to one of the least, uh, one to the least little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. And again, I don't know about you, but I've read this verse out of context so many times. And I've read this as, You know, if you help someone out who is needy, that God will bless you. But what is this really talking about? People that are serving God, using their gifts, if you will give them a cup of water along the way to help them out, anything you do to help someone use their gifts for God, you're going to receive a reward for that. So here's our last question for today. What is the blessing for and to those who receive your ministry. So those people that are helping you in your ministry, and then in turn for us, when we help others, what's that blessing to them? And the blessing to us. We're going to receive that. If you would, would you stand with me for a moment? Melanie, if you wouldn't mind coming. Today was more teaching than preaching But I'm hoping that you will take this home and will really search this out. Because the truth is, God has called you all. And his calling for you is not just to sit in this chair. I'm glad that you're here. I bless you for that. I'm glad that you're listening. But the truth is, God has a purpose for you all. You're all his ambassadors. That means that you represent him. Vic represents him. John represents him. Kat represents him to this world. And so as that representative, I want you to just close your eyes just for a moment. Jesus is here right in this place. Just as he sent his ambassadors, his disciples out to go and share the good news, he has given you gifts. I just want you to stop and think about that. What is the gift that he has given you? First of all, are you using that gift for him? And if not, I want to to call you out on behalf of the Lord and send you out. Go and use that gift you've received freely from God. Now go and use it. Some of you here might be afraid. Well, what if I do this? How is it going to affect my family? How is it going to affect my work situation? And all of these different things are swirling around in your head. And what I want to encourage you is, don't be afraid to stand up for God. Don't be afraid to use the gifts that He has given you. The people that you share with are going to be blessed. The people that come and help you are going to be blessed. And you will receive a reward as you faithfully use your gifts for Him. Stop right now in this moment. If you have Jesus Christ in your heart, 
and you love God, he has a gift for you. And I want to stop and ask you the question, are you using it for God right now? And before uh, we go any further, are there some of you here today that, that are convicted? God has put on your heart something that he wants you to do. And if you're honest right now, you're not using that gift for him. And maybe God's speaking to you and calling you to step out in faith and use that gift for him. If that's you today, would you mind raising your hand?